being here. Uh, I know we have a lot to cover today, but I wanted to start things off by talking about the allegations against the Blackhawks in the two pending lawsuits. I'm going to start by saying that the Blackhawks organization takes these allegations very seriously. It's important for me to say off the top that I do not condone or tolerate harassment or assault of any type. As you know, the Blackhawks have engaged an outside legal firm to conduct an independent review of these allegations, and we need to give the experts the necessary time and the latitude to do their job well. I understand that many of you will have questions on this topic, and there will be time to answer those questions. I'm eager to speak about this in more detail in the future. But for now, I have to respect the pending litigation and the independent review that's underway. I'm not going to be able to make any comments about that at this time. We have to let the process play itself out. Turning our attention to the Blackhawks news, um, I, I want to start by going into some things about Jonathan Tapes. As you know, uh, we haven't had a chance to talk since Jonathan um, you know, returned to the team. And I had a chance to meet with Jonathan uh, two days ago. We spent some time together. And first off, it was great to see him in person. Um, you know, when this all started back probably six or seven months ago, and I had a conversation with Jonathan and he indicated that he wasn't going to be able to, to, to be at our training camp. Uh, we didn't know where this was going or how long he was going to be away from the team. But the first and foremost thing was really concern about him as a person and taking the hockey part out of it. Um, you know, he's back with us now. It's nice to see he's been on the ice a little bit, but um, that's not really my focus. And in, in our, our talk the other day, um, it was good just to catch up on things and, you know, learn what he's been through. And for me, that's the the big thing is is focus on Jonathan getting back to feeling great. And uh, when the time is right and when he's able to join our team, um, we're certainly going to welcome him back. He's He's a big part of the group here and just just seeing him here daily training with the guys has been, has been a lot of fun. Um, I also want to touch on Duncan Keith. Um, we, ha we haven't had a chance to talk since uh, that trade was made, but um, you know, I've, I have so many great memories of Duncan as a black Hawk. And I think we all think about his contributions to the, the teams and Norris trophy and, and, you know, being the Conn Smythe winner and all those accolades. But for me, the one thing that I that I appreciate the most is, um, you know, his love of of the game of hockey and sharing it with his son. Uh, Colton is a big part of of Duncan's life, and I, I remember a couple times during the season, um, Duncan and I would would spend half an hour talking about what it's like. You know, he sees my kids around the rink quite a bit, and um, he would ask me questions about you know, how it was when they were little and you know, you could tell he was starting to really get into it. And uh, one time this year, um, only once Colton was able to come and visit. And I, I just remember how, how much that meant to Duncan. And um, so when I got the call a couple of weeks ago and, you know, they, they asked if we would consider trying to find a place so he could be closer to Colton. Um, it, it was hard in, in one sense, because he's been a fixture on our team for so many years. And, um, you know, I don't know if he ever got probably the right amount of um, credit for the role that he played on, on these great teams that we had in the past. But I, I wanted to do right by, by Dunk and to find a place that would allow him to, to be closer to Colton. So, you know, we're able to do that. And I guess I just want to take this time to, to thank him for all of his contributions to the Blackhawks. And um, um, we're excited for him and wish him the best in Edmonton. Um, we're a couple of days away from the draft here, and there's a lot of excitement with our group. Um, we're going to be able to have our, our staff in town, which is which is fun, you know, with last year and the pandemic and this, the draft being a virtual draft. We weren't able to actually have everybody in town for it. So it's great that we we're able to get them to Chicago and uh, we're going to be getting together later tonight as a group in person, which is the first time that's happening. And um, there's a lot of energy. And on top of the, the draft preparation, there's certainly a lot of movement around the league. 
with the expansion draft and free agencies uh, less than a week away. So uh, there's a lot of a lot of things happening. This is an exciting time. And uh, with that, I will uh, open it up to questions. Stan, thank you very much. We'll lead off with Scott Powers from The Athletic. Scott, your line is active. Please go ahead. Hey, Stan. With the uh, independent investigation, do you plan to participate in that? And do you hope those findings are made public? Uh, yes, Scott. I, uh, the, the review itself is something that, um, that I do plan to participate in. And I'm going to give it my full cooperation. Uh, you know, as far as where it goes, that's not something that, that I can comment on. But uh, I do know that we have some experts that we brought in. Um, you know, from my understanding, these are um, well-respected uh, people in the legal community, and um, I, I intend to fully cooperate with them. We'll next go to Mark Lazarus with The Athletic. Mark, your line is active. Please go ahead. Hi, Stan. As the cloud kind of covering this team, has, has it affected your job in any way? Has it affected your ability to do what you need to do with everything that's happening with the legal situation? Well, there's a lot going on, Mark. There's, there's no question about that. But, uh, you know, I have a job to do here, and that is uh, to build our team uh, as best I can. And that's what I'm focused on. So, uh, you know, we, we have a team approach here. There's a uh, my, my staff is fully engaged, and uh, we're going to do our best to to focus on improving our team and whether that's through the draft or through trades or through free agency, um, you know, we're, we're hard at work. We dedicate our time to this and uh, that's what we're focused on. So, I mean, it's business as usual, basically. It is. It is. Yes. Media, a quick reminder to use the raised hand function on your screen. And when those populate, we can get to those. We'll next go to Phil Thompson with the Chicago Tribune. Phil, your line is active. Please go ahead. Stan, I'm just like to ask if you can confirm that there was a May 2010 meeting uh, with then skills coach Paul Vincent. And do you remember what was said or what you said in that meeting? Yeah, Phil, that's that's something that's part of the investigation. It really wouldn't be right for me to be commenting on that right now. We'll next go to Joe Brand with WGN Radio. Joe, your line is active. Please go ahead. I stand with uh, Jonathan Taves' return. Uh, the process before it, you know, actually happened, and you know, everything was kind of fruition of him coming back. Was this kind of a gradual thing, or was there a day like, "Hey, things are moving in a positive direction"? How how, how was the timeline on that for him to come back? You mean? Yeah, yeah. To to be cleared and everything, both personally and medically, and everything. Uh. You know, that's probably something Johnny might be able to answer. I don't want to speak for him. When, when we spoke the other day, I wasn't really quizzing him on the timeline so much as I was just excited that he's he's back and he's feeling to the point where he's able to train and, and be with our, our group again here. So, um, you know, he can probably give you a little bit more details on the specifics there. But uh, I think for us, the, it's just exciting to see him around. I mean, he's been such a fixture on our team as our captain going back so many years that it was, it was different when he wasn't around. So, you know, he's here. I saw him earlier this morning, just seeing him walking in with a smile on his face, getting ready to train for the day. Um, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, uh, that I'm focused on. We'll next go to Charlie Romeliotis with NBC Sports Chicago. Charlie, your line is active. Please go ahead. Charlie, your line should now be active. Please go ahead. There we go. Uh, hey, Stan. Uh, obviously, with the dunking trade, it, it it obviously opened up some some more cap space for you guys. And, and with Shaw and Seabrook on LTIR, do you plan on on using that cap space, like getting aggressive this summer, or how, how do you maybe try to map out putting together the roster going forward? Hi, Charlie. Um, we do have some options, which is great. You know, in the past, I feel like we've been in a different situation relative to the salary cap so that um, maybe we didn't have as many avenues that we could pursue. I think right now we do have the ability uh, if we want to, um, that that's not going to preclude us from doing anything. Uh, you know, we, we have some flexibility. 
that was a big part of, of the Duncan Keith trade. Like I, I referenced, we certainly wanted to, to put him in a position that was going to work for him. But the benefit for us was we were able to get a young defenseman in Caleb Jones that we think has a lot of upside. He's, he's kind of just coming into his own. And on top of that, we cleared up some cap space. We got another draft pick for next year. So I think that trade really served a couple of different purposes for us and it put us in a position here leading into free agency where, you know, we're going to be able to pursue some players if, if it works out. We also are having some trade to conversations with teams and um, we're in a, a spot where we can maybe do some things relative to the cap. Um, it's true that we have, two players in Seabrook and Shaw that are injured and um, there's some ability to use long-term injury. If, if we want, that's not always the best approach if you can avoid it. So we're, we're looking at all of our options right now. Um, but I think we're positioned pretty well uh, as we head into the next few days here. I know last year it's more, we want to, you guys want to collect future assets, right? Do you feel like you're in a position where maybe you can start using those asset assets to acquire players, impact type players via trade? That's right. It's possible, Charlie. I think um, you're right. We were probably certainly looking to um, collect as many draft picks or young players as possible. And I think we had a, a pretty good season to be able to do that. Um, you know, we brought in some young players to trade, but we also, you know, made some, some moves where we acquired more draft picks. So, you know, looking at our group today, comparing it to a year ago, I think we've, we've built out our asset pool. And at some point you want to, you want to turn those into something else, but it doesn't necessarily have to be now. Um, I think what we're trying to do is assess what's out there in the market. And um, I will say, we're not going to just make transactions because we can, we, we, we do have an idea. We want to um, continue to be strategic about the moves that we make. Uh, so that's going to guide us over the next uh, couple of weeks here. We'll next go to Ben Pope with the Chicago Sun-Times. Ben, your line is active. Please go ahead. Hey, Stan. Uh, sort of building on that, what are your number, like number one, your, your top priorities for this offseason i know there's been a lot made of trying to maybe get a number one defenseman um is that the biggest thing you're looking for or what are you trying to add well ben i, I mean we're trying to continue to to push this forward in a couple of different areas um obviously if you have a chance to acquire a number one defenseman you have to look into it whether it's through free agency or through trade um but i say that uh, that would have been the case a year ago as well. That's just a, it's a critical piece of a team. The, there's not 32 number one defensemen in the league. You know, I was looking at this yesterday. There's probably 10 to 15 maybe that, that really categorize as, as number one defensemen. So it's a very small supply of those and they don't come available too often. So if they do, you have to investigate, does it work? Um, could it work? Uh, so that's not really anything different today than it would have been two years ago. Uh, we're probably positioned a little bit better today. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, it, it's very difficult to acquire top defensemen. So that's not our only focus. Um, I think we like our, our depth on defense. If you look at our group now, um, you know, we've seen some of our young defensemen take steps forward. Uh, you know, Adam Boquist, Bodan, and Mitchell, they all uh, show their NHL caliber players. We've added Caleb Jones and Riley Stillman. So, you know, we have a lot of young defensemen, and even Alec Regula got some time um, late in the season. So I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about our depth on defense. I think now what we're trying to do is uh, look up front, maybe for some, uh, you know, some help there. We do have some some new players coming back. When I say new, we didn't have Jonathan Taves or Alex Nylander last year. So uh, we have Henrik Borgstrom coming in. So we have quite a few players. And now we're trying to sift through that to find out what's the best combination and mixture for next year. So I wouldn't say we have like one glaring uh, weakness or one specific area that we're 
only trying to address. It's more of uh, small improvements throughout our lineup. On Taze and Nylander, um, you talked about Taze some already, but how confident are you that he'll be ready for opening day? And and for Nylander, what's his status? Yeah, well, Nylander's situation is a little bit different because he had a, a surgery and the return to play protocols for that are, are a little bit more um, in stone compared to what Jonathan's been going through. So yeah, Alex is going to be... 100%. I mean, he is now. He, he's ready to go. So by training camp, he's training and he's preparing like normal. So he, he'll be ready. Jonathan, we don't know. And uh, this is what I have been saying kind of all along. And I know some of the media either didn't like what I was saying or maybe was questioning it. But the truth is we don't know. And Johnny doesn't know how he's going to feel. And uh, none of us have a crystal ball to know how he's going to feel in September. I mean, he's here training and he's um, he's working through getting back to, uh, where he can, can play for us. Um, we'll just take that as it comes though. I don't think we have to try to, to put any pressure on him being ready for a certain date. We'll just see where it goes. We'll next go to John Dietz with the daily Herald. John, please go ahead. So I'm curious if the Blackhawks medical staff or doctors were involved in Taze's diagnosis or was that all outside and he was just had all those things you know diagnosed on his own i know johnny has been in contact with our doctors regularly throughout so um i can't speak in beyond that but i, I do know that um they've been in consultation uh you know jonathan is great about staying in touch with uh, mike gapsky and dr terry and our whole staff here so um you know we, we certainly have been in the mix, but the specifics of his treatment, that that's something that, that I wouldn't be speaking about. Yeah. So he was, I mean, while he was in contact with them, they weren't really, di they weren't the ones diagnosing him. That's what just want to clarify. Well, again, again, John, I, I, I'm not breaking it down to that level as far as who was doing the diagnosis. I just know that it was, a, it was a very good communication between Jonathan and, you know, that that's really more for him to speak about his medical um, the decisions he makes with his doctors. That's not something I would really have information on. We'll next go to Cheryl Ray Stout with WBEZ. Cheryl, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Stan, do you have serious concerns about the perception of yourself and the organization considering the lawsuits and the investigation that's going on? Well, Cheryl, here's what I can tell you. We take this very seriously. I take this very seriously, uh, but we have to let the process play itself out. And, you know, that's where things are today. And, um, you know, we're going to let this play itself out and you know, we'll probably be able to comment more on that at a different time, but that's where we are today. Our next question will come from Mark Lazarus with The Athletic. Hey, Stan, it was less than a year ago that we were talking about a rebuild here and there's going to be a patient in the long game and all that. A lot's happened since then with Seabrook and Shaw and uh, Keith. Um, does the cap space you have, does that expedite that process? Are you looking to be maybe more of a playoff team next year if possible? Has this process gone faster than maybe you were anticipating? Well, Mark, I think what we're, we're still building. And I think I think there's the temptation to try to label what we are, where we are in that um, in that progression, we, of course, the, the reason we're putting all this work in is we want to be, we want to be a playoff team. We want to win. We want to have that excitement of, um, being a top team and we're not where we want to be, but it does take a process to get there. And I think we're, we're well into that process. As far as the next steps, we need to continue on the path that we're on, which is, um, you know, giving our young players an opportunity. That's what we talked a lot about going back to last October um, was really giving them a chance to show us what they can do as well as, you know, take the next step in their career. And if we have enough of the young players taking small steps, then our team should be taking steps as well. Now, if you have an opportunity throughout to then accelerate that progress of course we want to do that. That's, that's what we're, we've been doing that really over the last few months, having conversations 
trying to see, is there a way to make this go quicker? Um, I think the challenge there is uh, you don't want to do things which are maybe irresponsible to to just quicken the process. So we're committed to where we're headed with with trying to build things up. Um, if we can take a step forward, whether it's in the next couple of weeks, couple of months, or during the season, if we have the ability to make a transaction that's going to accelerate our progress, we're certainly going to approach that. Um, so it it's not doesn't have to be one or the other. Our next question will come from Carter Baum with Blackhawks.com. Carter, please go ahead. Hey, Stan, uh, looking ahead to the weekend, is there a, a more of a comfort level this year going into the second year of a virtual draft, knowing kind of the process of scouting players by video and everything that goes into that? Uh, yes, definitely, Carter. I think we uh, – I've had some conversations with our staff just uh, earlier today about – um, how really the world has changed and the scouting world. I think you try to take the best out of a, a strange situation. Uh, I think, you know, two years ago, if you would have asked me this question, it, it would have been a different answer, but I think we found uh, a different way to operate. Uh, and we've had a lot of communication with our, our scouting staff, much more frequent uh, virtual meetings than we used to have and a lot more viewings um, of players on video and it was good that we were able to supplement that with some in-person, but um, it, it's a new way of looking at scouting and I think it's a better way. I, I, I like where we're at. I think our staff is energized. Um, they've really taken to it and it's led to a lot more conversation, a lot more dialogue, a lot more people seeing players from other regions that they wouldn't have the ability to do when you're only in person. So uh, you know, I think it's uh, we're making the best of it. And um, the draft itself, uh, it's a different format when you're not in, in an arena. Um, but I think there's some benefits to that, too. So we're, we're trying to take advantage of all that. Um, and so far, it's been it's been great. And I know last year you guys had different members of the hockey operations department kind of announce those picks, your way of just giving a nod to some of those people doing the work. News yesterday that uh, eight different female employees are going to be making those picks this year. What kind of went into that and um, how proud of an, as an organization um, does that make you guys to be able to kind of highlight some of those uh, females in those roles? That's something I take a lot of pride in. I really do. I, I've, uh, you know, we looked at where we were a couple of years ago and um, we didn't have nearly enough representation uh, in our hockey ops group from females. And um you know, Megan Hunter has been with, with us the longest and, uh, you know, she, she does everything for us. I mean, she touches every part of our organization and, and this year she's taken on a new role uh, in addition to everything she was doing. She was, uh, she became an amateur scout as well. Uh, so that's something that w was fun to see her evolution as an executive to, uh, to now be, you know, a pretty big voice in our scouting group. Uh, but it's not just her. And um, we made a conscious effort uh, over the last year or two to seek out um, women to be part of our group. And they, they bring so much to the table with their, um, you know, their knowledge of the game. And I think uh, it's made us a better staff. And um, that's something that I'm excited about. I'm thrilled that we're, we're having them here to be, to participate in the draft. And, uh, you know, this is, this is really just the beginning for me. I think, um, you know, I've seen the benefits of it and it's something that uh, I would expect to continue to expand in the coming years. Well, let's go to John Dietz with the Daily Herald. I just want to follow up on Jonathan for a second. Can you get a sense of how he's doing? Is it, is it hard to tell? I mean, it's only July, I know, but just have you been able to, how has, how is he doing and how, how does he, what's he telling you on that front? Like on the ice or off the ice? I guess both would be good. Um, yeah, when I talked to him, I actually didn't even talk much about his hockey at all. It was more just about, you know, his, you know, he went through a lot. And I think it was, um, that really was my concern was more just how's he, how's he managing this? How's he feeling? And he seems to be feeling a lot better. Uh, when I talked to him, he was in a great, great spirits. 
Um, really excited to be here at the rink and talking to everybody again. Uh, Jeremy was in town, uh, so we all three sat down and chatted about things as well. So, uh, I mean, I know I see him on the ice. I watch him. I know he's, um, you know, he's working on his his skills. Like, you know, in the summertime, your training is typically a bit different. You're, you're more um, fine-tuning some of your technical work. So as far as being ready to to play in a, in a, like a team practice or whatnot, I don't, I don't really have a feel for that. But, uh, you know, he's out there working on uh, – I think a lot of players tinker with different things in the summer, you know, changing their stick or changing their skates and all that kind of stuff. And I think Jonathan's no different. So um, that was, was great. We'll next go to Stephen Wino with the Associated Press. Stephen, your line is active. Hey, Stan, I asked you this as, as a Blackhawks GM and, and USA Hockey GM. Um, you guys present two versions of the schedule today, one with an Olympic break, one without. I'm curious just kind of how different are those schedules and, and kind of what do you make of, of just the general situation right now, kind of not knowing what's going to happen next season with the Olympics? That's right, Stephen. Um, we did receive two schedules. Uh, I think, you know, the league is kind of working in parallel paths. I know you know, the, there's certainly a strong desire to go to the Olympics and uh, there's some details to, to be fine tuned uh, and work out. And I'm not really sure where those stand, but um, you know, the schedules are certainly different just because the, the Olympic schedule has that, that large break in the month of February. So, um, you know, I, I have to tip my cap to the schedule makers. They, they have a tough job. There's 32 teams and they're doing, two schedules for both, but, um, you know, either way, how, however the schedules shake out, um, you know, we will make it work. And, um, you know, if the Olympics do come to be, I think it would be a fantastic opportunity. I know the players are hopeful of that. Um, and if the details can get worked out, um, you know, it would be, it would be pretty exciting. Time for a few more questions. The next one will come from Ben Pope with the Chicago Sun Times. Ben, your line is active. Please go ahead. Hi, Stan. Me again. Um, you have uh, a number of free agents coming up. Um, I wonder if you can give any update on sort of what your conversations with them have been like, uh, particularly guys like Zadorov and, and Henestroza, who maybe are sort of more 50-50 if they'll stay. We do have a number of uh, free agents, uh, some restricted, some unrestricted uh, free agents. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to really – share too much there but there's a lot of uh conversations happening around the league i mean this year was a bit unusual we we just got through the expansion draft so um i think just across the league there's uh, a lot of movement of players and as a result that leads to conversations and discussions on you know if you're going to reshape your team this is when most of those things happen uh, so we are doing, uh, a lot of work on, on the contract stuff behind the scenes, but I'm not in a position today to really comment on, uh, where we're going to head with any of those. Next question will come from Charlie Rumeliotis. Hey Stan, I wanted to ask you about the, the goaltending situation. I know last year it was about which one of the three will, will emerge or you, you didn't know what you had in, in them, but with the, the league going back to an 82 game schedule and um, are you comfortable rolling it back with those three goaltenders to continue that competition or, or would it make more sense to kind of look externally and, and kind of add some, maybe a veteran presence to alleviate some of that? That's a possibility, Charlie. Um, yeah. I think last year we saw that each of the three goalies had moments when they looked really good. I mean, certainly Kevin had the longest run of the three. Uh, but we saw, you know, late in the year, we saw Colin get uh, a chance and he showed um, he can play some really good hockey and kind of in the middle section there, Malcolm uh, had some great moments too. So um, I think they all showed they have flashes of it. And, uh, but, you know, this is the time of year when you know, we're going to look around and see what might make, make or w- what give us a different look. Um not sure if we'll change in the goalie area, um, but there's a lot happening around the league right now. So uh, I would say that um, we have to wait and see how that plays out over the next you know, 10 days or so. Next question will come from Phil Thompson with the Chicago Tribune. 
Uh, Stan, just wondering if the expansion draft, and sorry if you touched on some of these points earlier, but just wondering if the expansion draft laid out the way that you expected uh, from the Hawks' perspective and if you had pursued any kind of side deals uh, with the Kraken. Well, uh, I didn't really know how it was going to play out, so I, I tried to go into it with an open mind without too many expectations. And, um, you know, we all did our projections as well, and, uh, you know, things don't always go the way you project them. So um, I think we learned from the situation four years ago with Vegas was you have to somewhat expect the unexpected. And, um, and you know, you're going to lose one player not more than one player. Uh, every team lost one player. So um, we did a lot of work leading into it, preparation, and now here we are on the other side of it, and we saw what happened amongst other teams. I think really what the what the conversations are like now, um, you know, some teams did you know, lose a player. Maybe they didn't want to or weren't expecting to, and they're having to shift their focus. Um, so, we're, you know, we're getting some phone calls on the inbound side, um, trying to check around to see if they can uh, maybe find a, a match for a player that they lost. So, you know, that's really my, the way I'm handling it right now. Um, you know, I think the, the Seattle thing work was fine for us. And now we're, we're really getting ready for, it's sort of a combination. We've got the draft, we've got trades between now and free agency. And then next Wednesday, we've got free agency. So there's a lot of activity uh, in the next six days. And um, this is uh, this is the fun part of the year. Our final question will come from Joe Brand with WGN Radio. Joe, please go ahead. Stan, just kind of piggybacking on the expansion draft. Uh, I'm sure you kind of, like you said, assessed your roster moving forward with whoever Seattle would take from you guys. But what are the pros and cons of this roster moving forward after they had selected Quinville? Uh, well, I guess, you know, the simple answer is it, it doesn't really impact our roster significantly. I mean, John didn't, didn't really impact us a lot at all in Chicago last year. He was, uh, you know, he was a good player for us in Rockford, but uh, you know, in the here and now it, it doesn't really change anything. So I think what, what we're looking at more so is, trying to balance some of the calls that are coming our way from teams that did lose some players. Um, and, you know, we, we, we kind of covered this a little bit earlier. We do have a lot of players. We have a lot of NHL players, both at forward and defense, even in, in goal. Uh, so what we're really trying to do is see if there's maybe some matches that match up better um, with other teams when maybe they have a, a player that is a style that we don't have as much. So, um, I would say that we weren't impacted significantly in the expansion draft. Um, and now we're looking to see if we can move some players around. Stan, thank you very much for your time this morning. That's all the questions we have for you. Thank you. Mark, we're going to begin with Charlie Romaliotis from NBC Sports Chicago. Charlie, your line is active. Hey, Mark. Uh, so who are you guys picking? No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Charlie, we seem to have lost connection. <laughs> um, again tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> i know i know we talked last week uh what have these last several days been like for you is it finalizing the draft board or, or are you talking to other teams to kind of get a sense of what direction they might go in so you know who might be available for you guys at number 12 yep a little of all of the above we've been uh working the phones trying to get an idea of what's going to happen before us uh, give us a little bit, make it the uh, little more clarity so we know who is going to be available and who we're looking at. Uh, I think we're a little bit closer from when we talked last week, but um, we, we still have a little work to do there. You, you feel comfortable with the pool of players that are going to be available for you at 12? Yeah, very, very. Yeah, because uh, we know that forfeiture is going in the, in the top 11. We'll next go to Scott Powers with The Athletic. Hey, Mark. With uh, with you guys drafting Drew Camaso in the second round and then signing Arvid Soderbloom, does that does that affect whether, I, I guess, your thought process possibly drafting a goalie in the first round? Well, I, I think we're aware of what we have for depth in the organization. But, uh, you know, our job at the draft table is really to get the uh, best, uh, you know, available 
player, the player that we think can uh, impact the Blackhawks the most. And if it's a goaltender, we go in that direction. From what you guys have seen, are, are, are those two goalies potentially first round worthy? Oh, they're definitely first first round worthy. Uh, I think both of the, you know, you look at their work this year and in the past, um, they, you know, it stands. We'll next go to Phil Thompson with the Chicago Tribune. Hey, Mark. Uh, so the, when, when you look at what you're targeting in the, in the draft, do, do you uh, look at areas of need or how much do you weigh that, like with scoring from the wing or, you know, if you can get a center knowing how valuable centers are? What, what's your philosophy in that regard? Well, the philosophy, we're, we're always, um, you know, we keep in mind what the, our – depth chart as an organization looks like. But when we get to, you know, especially in the first round and the second round, um, you know, we're looking for the best available talent. The talent has to fit with the way we play, what we want to do. But uh, I, I don't think we go into a draft looking at a, a specific position. Obviously, some positions, you know, the center position is very, very important. Goaltending position is very, very important. And, you know, if you're looking at a number one, number two defenseman, uh, there's a lot of value there. How much do you let external factors weigh into your decision making, um, especially at the top of the draft? You know, there's Stanford's talking about, uh, you know, teams coming to them to talk trade after the expansion draft. Um, you know, you have other factors with free agency. Uh, is it all part of your puzzle or do you just lock focus on what's on the board? Well, my, my focus is totally on the draft. So, it, you know, it, it could change within the hour, within the day. Um, but at the moment, I'm looking at us, you know, we have eight picks in the draft. So that's really our focus. We have one in the first, two in the second. So until that changes, um, that's really our focus. Media, if you have questions for Mark Kelly, please utilize the raised hand function on your screen and we can get to those when they populate in the queue. We'll next go to Joe Brand with WGN Radio. Joe, please go ahead. Hi, Mark. Just kind of going back to one of your earlier statements, working the phones to see where teams are leading. For the most part, are these teams pretty receptive to those calls? I feel like teams would normally be a little bit more close to the vest with what they're trying to do, but do you feel like teams are see that as a benefit to be more communicative with you? No, Joe. There's really the um... – we're not getting a lot of communication with the teams ahead of us on who they're going to take. Uh, that really comes from talking to, um, you know, agents, uh, staying in contact with players. Um, we, you know, we find out where their conversations have been going and that's where, uh, you know, we kind of build the board and make our predictions on who's going where. Our next question will come from John Dietz with the Daily Herald. Hey, Mark. Curious what you think about the draft over, like the draft class overall. It seems like every year it's like, yeah, this is the best draft class. It's like we hear that a lot. But what do you think of this draft class? I mean, it's a top, good top 40, good top 50, or what's your thoughts there? Well, I, I think this draft um, through probably, you know, through two and a half rounds, I think it has a lot of depth. In the depth is both at the forward position and the uh, defense position, and also the goaltending. I think the depth of the goaltenders in this draft is very, very strong. If we look at the first round, I, I think with this draft, um, we're really projecting on where we think these players are going to get to. Um, I don't think the draft order, the order is going to be based upon where they are right now. I think there's a lot of projections in these players this year. And what about the, have you guys been able to do things a little more normally this year in terms of not just scouting, but talking to guys, or has it been a lot of Zooms like it was last year? Uh, we've done, uh, we, we've been able to communicate with players. Uh, there, there are some restrictions on us. We weren't allowed to have uh, in-person type meetings, interviews with players, but we were able to communicate over the phone, texting, um, and then we spent a lot of time on the Zoom calls. The, the Zooms have actually... Uh, I think what we've learned, there's a lot of value in them. There's no time uh, restrictions. Um, 
And you find when you're talking to the players, the players that are home, uh, they're comfortable and their focus is on you. And likewise, our focus is totally on them. We'll next go to Ben Pope with the Chicago Sun-Times. Hey, Mark. Uh, I know most of the time is when we're asking you questions, they're forward-looking. But uh, when you look back on the Lucas Reichel selection last year and, and the season he had, how happy are you to see um, you know that pick seeming to, to pan out well so far? I uh, would, you know, uh, you, you look back. Anytime you look back at a draft a year later, um, you, you like to see if you were – correct on how you projected the player. And I, I think Lucas has met all of our projections and uh, exceeded them. So uh, very, very excited to where he's at and uh, looking forward to seeing him in camp. Thanks. Our next question will come from Pat Boyle with NBC Sports Chicago. Hey, Mark, uh, you talked about the depth at goalie. Uh, w- when you look at a lot of the rankings and some of the mocks, uh, between Wallstead and Kosa, uh, some have Kosa going first in that first round. Others have Wallstead. Do you have both of those goalies closely evaluated? Do you feel there is a clear cut number one? Um, well, obviously, if you look at our board, um, we have, you know, we have one ahead of the other. I think when you look at them, um, I, I think if you polled. 32 teams, I think it, um, it, it would be really interesting uh, when we go back and we find out a little bit more to see where the teams had them, to see if it was 50-50 or if uh, teams go in the same direction that we're going. And how big is the gap in evaluation between the, the first round goalies that I mentioned and those that might be available in the second round? Uh, I think it's significant and probably because when you're talking about Wallstead and Kosa, their body of work this year uh, has separated them from the other goaltenders available in the draft. One final ask to media. If you do have questions, please utilize the raised hand function on your screen when those populate in the queue. We will call on you. Mark, it appears that is the last question of the day. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody.